Let's try and keep quiet, everyone. And now we will move on to the session on COVID. COVID-19 is behind us, but we would like to discuss the question. Thank you for your help, sir. So we would like to address the question, even though COVID-19 is pretty much behind us, and you're probably asking yourself, how is that topic relevant? But we think it is relevant, and we'd like to address the question, has COVID-19 better prepared us for the next pandemic? Hopefully there won't be such a pandemic, but we have to be prepared for any scenario. I'm honored to invite the first speaker to the stage, Professor Mark Diebol, who is Chief Strategy Officer at the Center for Global Health Practice and Impact at Georgetown University. And now, I'm, I'd like to invite Professor Gili Regev Yochai, Head of the Infection Prevention and Control Units, Director of the Sheba Pandemic Research Institute at the Sheba Medical Center. You know, they always have these very long titles. And this session is uh, moderated by Professor Johnny Gershoni, a professor of virology and immunology at Tel Aviv University. But a moment before we begin a 30 second uh, video. I assume we can start. So just give me the 30 minutes on the clock. So first of all, welcome. We'll be conducting the discussion in English. Um, December 2019, the Chinese reported a cluster of severe pneumonia in Wuhan. Um, by the end of February, there were over 80,000 cases reported. And in, on March 11th, 2020, the World Health Organization, the WHO, uh, declared a global pandemic. Now, initially, we were optimistic, and we assumed that coronavirus, SARS coronavirus 2, the cause of COVID-19 uh, would peter out in the summer as did SARS coronavirus one. However, unfortunately, we've been coping with a massive natural disaster um, for the course of the last three years. But if I look around in the room, social distancing in the previous lecture was not a problem. Nobody's wearing a mask. And for the most part, Corona seems to have passed. Can you give me some perspectives as to where has the coronavirus pandemic disappeared? Gilly, please. Yeah, so uh, in short, I'll say that uh, I, the virus is not gone, okay? And I don't think it has weakened. Uh, we'll, I don't know what Mark thinks about that. And I think really the role of the place where we are, which I call it the post-pandemic phase, is due to uh, vaccination and the, what we can call maybe partial herd immunity. Um, but let me go back to January 2020 and maybe explain why, in a way, that was obvious then. And, and I actually was one of those, and I know many more, 
uh, who thought it's not just going to go away. It's not like SARS-1. And the point where I understood that was when I heard about the German conference where it was very obvious that there was asymptomatic people who are infective. And once they are infecting others and we can't detect them, we can't just tell them like in SARS-1, stay at home or be isolated, quarantined. We can't do that because we don't know who they are. This is going to spread and we're going to have a pandemic. And in order to stop that, we have to have some kind of preventive measures like vaccines. And if we don't have that, it's just going to continue to spread. I didn't know how severe it's gonna be, if we'll have 1% mortality or 20% mortality. That was very frightening in those days. But I think that was really one of the points. And if, to come back of where we are now in the current stage, I think that, again, COVID is still circulating. We're seeing it. Whether it's going to be some kind of another seasonal coronavirus, very mild, milder than flu, um, I don't know, that's optimistic. We are seeing emerging variants ongoing. We don't know what the next variant is going to be. I think we need to be prepared for the worst, but hope for the best. So we'll deal with prepar preparedness in a moment. Mark, why don't you give us some of your perspective? Just very quickly, building on, on what Julie said, um, you know, I think it's been said and is true. We're done with the virus. It's not done with us. Uh, we're tired. We don't want to deal with it, but it's still there. As of March of this year, it was the fourth leading cause of death in the United States. Fourth leading cause of death in the United States. It is very much still here. Um, for the future, we don't know where it's going. Like many viruses, I would just give two cautionary notes. Coronaviruses are very different than other viruses, and people have not paid enough attention to that. We have known for years, coronaviruses cause about a third of common colds. So we haven't studied them a lot because they haven't killed a lot of people until SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-1 and MERS before. What we do know about coronaviruses is that you can be infected with the exact same genetic strain a year apart and get just as sick. So we have known that our immunity does not last, which is why we've been getting all these boosters. Uh, and so we don't know what we're ready for or not ready for, uh, which makes herd immunity a little more difficult. The second is variants, as Julie mentioned, and we don't, influenza, we're watching right now a variant. Uh, like that, we will see variants. And whether it's next year, in five years, in 10 years, will we see a 20% fatality rate coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2? We have no idea. Let, let me, in that case, mention that the caution that was mentioned in the introduction, are we prepared for uh, the next emerging pandemic, spoiler. Yes, they're going to be emerging pandemics. We're, they're going to see them. And so, Mark, maybe you can give us, due to a global perspective, what have we learned about COVID-19? What lessons uh, indicate that the pandemic was handled well, as opposed to where were the errors? And uh, some thoughts about preparedness. So, I, you know, I hate to be a big spoiler, but I think we're in worse shape now than we were two and a half years ago. That's enough. Yeah? Yeah, okay. Uh, and we will not fight a new pandemic well at all. It'll be a repeat of what happened last time. What we did well uh, is not much. A couple of countries did well. These are countries that had SARS-1 uh, and had existing systems. So they moved and did contact tracing and social distancing and very quickly and had very few cases. Uh, I'll come back to where they, what happened to them later in the pandemic. Uh, the second thing we did well is the research community came together rapidly and worked collaboratively globally. Um, and that led to pretty rapid advance, including the vaccine. However, that vaccine was built on 15 years of investments in mRNA technology, which had largely failed for everything else. And it was built on an accident that two researchers from NIH had stabilized the spike protein, which was essential to create effective vaccines. Effectively, things that happened for 15 years for other purposes. Now, we're working on potential platform technologies, but we're not there yet. And so while we did well on the collaborative research before, and some countries did well, they're both very indicative of what we did wrong. So, uh, the biggest thing we did wrong is had no humility in the face of a pandemic. 
at least public facing humility in the face of something we really didn't understand. Um, the, in terms of the countries that did well, they got very complacent. And when Omicron came along, they did very poorly because they had stopped the contact tracing, they'd stopped uh, their social distancing, and they didn't buy any vaccines, and no one was vaccinated. And so they got hit pretty hard. So what looked good at the beginning, lack of humility, they thought they were done, they thought they were fine, and then they did just as badly as everyone else later on. On the vaccine front, um, the humility piece has not played out at all. We do not have good technology for future pandemics, and we are way too vaccine dependent. So by the time you get a vaccine produced, you already have a pandemic. We've barely focused on treatment. We have terrible treatments uh, for this pandemic, and we don't have very good antiviral treatments at all. If you had good antivirals, you could battle almost any virus, keep it down low, so you prevent it from becoming a pandemic so that you can develop a vaccine. We've done very poorly on that. The other thing we did extraordinarily poorly on is communications, and that was lack of humility. Instead of saying, this is what we know now, we don't know, it might have a lot of asymptomatic transmission, many of us said this, not many, but enough of us. Um, we didn't say, this is what we know today, it could change tomorrow because we don't understand where this virus is going, so we make these recommendations today, like masking, like social distancing, like closing schools, like shutting down airports and shutting down communities. But we knew by June, July, you didn't need to close elementary schools. Yet we kept, at least in the United States, them closed. So now there's a massive backlash because we didn't communicate. And now people look back and say, well, you didn't need to close those schools and you did. Why do I trust you? You told us masks work. The global data show they don't. Well, they do work on an individual basis. They don't work on a collective basis. And if you're in a compromise, you need one. But we weren't nuanced in our communication. And now, because of that, going into the next pandemic, no one trusts us. Let so that's a problem. Then shift to Gilly and say, are we doing anything to prepare ourselves based on the lessons and for the future? Yeah, so um, again, maybe I'll start with what we have learned in Israel and specifically uh, um, through some of the work that we've been doing at Sheba. And we very early in the pandemic established what we call the Sheba Healthcare Worker Cohort. And what we did was recruit any healthcare worker who agreed to donate blood on a monthly basis and we followed their uh, immune response to infections, to the vaccines once it was there. We understood very early that we need real world evidence on how the vaccine, the vaccine effectiveness, on correlates of protection, uh, all of that. And uh, actually we learned a lot from that. We have many, many outcomes that not just Israel, but the world uh, learned from that. Uh, among them was the decision to give a third uh, dose. That was, this is the only or the first time, and I think the only time, that Israel decided to give uh, a medicine before FDA approval. And that was based on uh, some of these studies. So, um, and, and then on the other hand, we learned after the fourth dose that it's maybe necessary only for immune suppressed and not for everybody. Or it may help slightly, but you know, don't have high expectations. And I think all of this that we've learned actually uh, brought us to a lot of international collaborations. Among them, most importantly, was the, or is the collaboration with the NIH. And with that, we now established what we call SPRY, which so this is- This is at Chiba. Uh, this is at Chiba. It's the Chiba uh, Pandemic Preparedness Research Institute. And we are looking um, uh, forward into how can we learn one from this cohort, but maybe later I'll mention other cohorts that we're now building. One is uh, due uh, through a, a lot of uh, uh, novel technologies that have been developed at the NIH by uh, Professor Danny Dueck, and we've trained part of our team already there, and uh, they're coming over here. And we now have uh, these techni techniques to uh, actually develop monoclonal antibodies, which can be given as a treatment, and they're also passive uh, immunization uh, to various uh, uh, pathogens. Right now, we're still looking mainly at COVID, 
And um, that's one of the things we're doing. Another thing we're doing is looking at, together with a pharmaceutical company, looking at a pan-corona va uh, vaccine that we can hopefully develop. So these are the kind of things that we're looking for the future. So this would be a pan-corona vaccine, meaning one vaccine that would be effective against even unanticipated as yet variants of concern. Which is right, of course and maybe against the SARS-1, maybe against MERS as well, yeah. yeah. Now, uh, Mark, you said that, not to quote you, but that the job done in generating effective drugs was pretty miserable. Uh, are there any technologies, new approaches, advancements that you can say might be useful to implement in order to try to anticipate not only variations in COVID, but new pathogens, other viruses, other diseases? There is fortunately technology and we hope it'll be a solution. By the way, you're very fortunate you're working with Danny Duick. He started NIH a couple years after me. I was in Tony Fauci's lab, he was in another. We collaborated a lot, so Danny's the best. Um, it's been talked about a lot at this conference, artificial intelligence, large language models, mach machine learning is extraordinarily op uh, op op optimistic for the future and what it could do. So we can, with machine learning, with large language models, we can predict variants and viruses. We can predict uh, from zoonotic, we trace what's happening in animals, and we can predict what genetic jumps are necessary to get into humans. We're tracking a couple right now that look pretty scary. Um, and this is going to happen more and more because of climate change, uh, because we're encroaching on our environment and getting closer to animals, particularly in low and middle income countries. Uh, and there's a lot of exposure without uh, poor nutrition, a lot of other things. But you can predict all of that with artificial intelligence, large language models. And we are very hopeful and think we can do a lot with that. There is, however, a risk with that. And I think some of the conversation here, most of the risk so far is focused on social media, democracy. There's a real risk in biosecurity. And I'm actually going from here to chair a Bellagio conference with the top people from the White House and the 10 Downing and the European Commission. Uh, on biosecurity in the age of artificial intelligence. And you live in a bad neighborhood, as the chief of the general staff just kind of pointed out. So as we're developing things, as we're looking at what variation in a virus will make it more infectious, how would you respond to that or not? Good actors will be doing that to help. Bad actors could be doing that for ba very bad reasons. And I've heard very senior US defense officials worried that Russia will be doing, could be doing some bad things in Ukraine with effectively tactical nukes, but with bioweapons. Other neighbors of yours have used bioweapons in the recent decade. And we are not far um, from someone in their garage because of AI, if it's too accessible and if sequences are available in too accessible a way, being able to design the next pandemic virus that could wipe out the world and be 20 to 50% deadly, not 1% deadly. So how do you balance those two? And that's where there's the risk of bad things happening, but there's also the risk of us over-regulating and effectively unilaterally disarming while the bad actors are going. So where is the sweet spot between allowing the positives of AI while trying to limit and mitigate the downsides of AI? So it's a good bad and hopefully we'll err on the good side. This seems to be the case for every new emerging technology, that it has wonderful, amazing potentials, as well as very serious dangers. Um, you know, you had mentioned, Gilly, that the new institute uh, is trying to implement monoclonal antibodies. Uh, monoclonal antibodies are the antibodies, but target very specifically a given infectious disease or pathogen. Maybe you can help us better understand with some concrete examples. Yeah, so but maybe just before I answer that, I'll, I'll go back to the AI please, and where please, we're, and course. then uh, I'll connect to that. Because with the AI, what we're doing is, uh, again, with the NIH and the pharmaceutical uh, company, looking at, through the uh, uh, Shiba Healthcare Worker Cohorts, we have both the data for each person, what kind of exposure he had. So whether he was infected with Delta or with Alpha or now with Omicron, which Omicron, 
uh, whether he got vaccine, how many vaccine doses, all of that data, together with from his blood, the blood samples that we have from these people, we know how well they neutralize each different uh, uh, variant. So and the importance is through the insight that you had to generate the data set, exactly. which is amazing. Exactly, and with that, the idea is to build a new vaccine. So that's, and, and that's uh, not necessarily gonna be an mRNA vaccine. So that's one uh, um, aspect of what we're doing. But if we're going to the monoclonal, which is what we're actually uh, concentrating right now on, so one immediate thing is we already have uh, a few discoveries of monoclonal antibodies from, again, these samples that are well neutralizing of the new uh, emerging variants, the XBB of Corona. of Corona, which right now we don't have. So mainly monoclonal antibodies, I, I should say, right now serve the immunocompromised population. And they really don't have a solution. They're still, we are all, you know, beyond this. We feel that COVID is over. They don't feel that way. And I see these patients in clinic. And they come and they say, what can we do? We're scared to go abroad. We're, because, you know, for them it's still a big deal if they get, whether they get flu or whether they get COVID, which is worse. And for them right now, the solution is monoclonal antibodies. Vaccines are not as effective for them. And the monoclonal antibodies that we had up to recently, the Evoshield before there was the Regeneron, they were well, they're not working on the new uh, variant. So if we succeed to actually go and manufacture something like that, that might be uh, so that's one corona, solution. But can that's you corona. Think in others, yeah. so people can so think a little have, bit out of the yeah. box. We have right now actually uh, blood being uh, uh, um, transferred into Sheba from people who are going to the Hajj. Okay, so the Hajj is going to happen in a month, and the Hajj, like any very condensed place where a lot of people meet, very crowded, coming from all over the world. That's a very good opportunity for any virus, whether it's gonna be COVID, whether it's gonna be Mars, MERS, whether it's gonna be a combination of these, whether it's gonna be a new uh, virus. So the idea is to collect blood before they go, after they return, we're gonna collect all the data whether something happened and people had any kind of uh, um, uh, inf new infections that we're not aware of. And if something happens, we have the blood from which now we've learned how to produce monoclonal antibodies against whatever will come up. So we're actually looking you know, forward before we even know what we're looking for. And that's one thing we're doing. Another thing is looking at something that we do know, well, you know the, the mo most, uh, I guess, uh, frightful uh, uh, pandemic that everybody was afraid of was the bird flu. Uh, before uh, COVID came up. And uh, in Israel, actually, we had a very large outbreak of cranes oh. that had, we had 8,000 cranes that, uh, agurim uh, in Hebrew, that uh, died in the Achula. And uh, a lot of people had to be exposed to take them out of the... Uh, and their H5N1 flu right. is the same that could infect and be very dangerous to us. Exactly. We didn't have any uh, human uh, uh, beings that, that were, yeah, any human cases, but these people were exposed and potentially maybe they developed antibodies and maybe that's why they didn't get infected. But if we can get those antibodies, develop monoclonal antibodies up front, if at some point we have a pandemic, we'll have something ready immediately and not have to wait for a year or again a year was very lucky as you mentioned it, it can ha it can take much longer we'll have something prepared within weeks so that's the idea mark i'd like to ask you you had mentioned the fact that the vaccine was the product of uh extraordinary work barney graham and, and others at the nih uh in stabilizing the antigen and of course the messenger rna technology which is new and yet, you also mentioned the fact that corona is a really nasty bug, and it doesn't seem to comply. People can get vaccinated, they are protected, but then they come infected again. What's going on with corona, and what would you say about future vaccines? So we don't know, and because no one studied coronavirus in depth because there's no money in it because it caused common cold. So why would you spend a lot of money on something that causes common cold? 
we're starting to learn more, and I think we will learn a lot. Just like at the beginning, we knew nothing about HIV. We now understand the immune response because of the investments in HIV. My guess is that it is producing some substance that inhibits the immune response. But it's probably not the only virus that does that. So for example, we know that coronaviruses emit a substance that blocks interferon, which is a key part of our immune response. So does hepatitis B, so do other viruses. Measles. Measles. RSV. Um, so there's the potential to start thinking about, well, are there pan, not just coronavirus, but pan viral antivirals, uh, for example, interferon, that could be used in the, in the early part of an outbreak of any viral infection, not necessarily to eliminate it, but to bring it down to a low enough level that by the time we have a vaccine, it's still an outbreak, not a pandemic. Because again, by the time you get to vaccines, you are in a pandemic state. So what can we do to bring that down? And, I, and what coronavirus is doing is very important. The other thing we should be doing and we're not doing is linking the worlds of oncology and infectious diseases. So cancers do a great job of emitting things over time and, and modifying themselves to protect the immune response from clearing the cancers. Viruses are like cancer. They live inside cells, uh, which is why they're so difficult to get at. And so if we bring these worlds together, and again, artificial intelligence, large language model learning could help us do that, we could start identifying things that no matter what happens, we would be ready. But no one cares anymore. We say we, we should be doing All the money for this stuff is dried up. People aren't investing in it anymore. Some drug companies are, but we're pretty much done with it. If we stuck with it and actually invested now, it could not just be for infectious diseases, it could not just be for pandemics, it could be for many infectious diseases, it could apply to cancer, it could apply to autoimmune diseases, many things. So that's the opportunity with artificial intelligence, um, using it properly to allow us to jump these different fields. But it's very optimistic if we invest and, and take the time to, to play with it. I like the concept that it's very optimistic and AI is being used amongst others to analyze the wonderful database that's been collected in Chiva. And so under these circumstances, I think it's a good place to stop the discussion. Thank you very much.